Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Research America briefing. From Nobel winning science to next generation treatment, tracing the path of a rare disease breakthrough through RNAi. Thanks to all of you joining us from the rare disease community. We look forward to hearing from our distinguished guests about where this technology can take us in regards to new treatments and hope. Today's briefing will tell the story of a full pipeline from discovery to development to delivery. We'll hear about worms as well as novel partnerships and everything in between. In your uh, reminder email this morning, we included a link to a handout uh, which explains this journey very graphically and it's now in the chat. We wanna thank Alnylam Pharmaceuticals for their terrific partnership and support for today's briefing. Since we're on Zoom webinar, all audience members will be on mute, but please type your questions into the Q&A box and my colleague Terry will pose as many questions as possible to the panel during the Q&A period. So now let's introduce our terrific panel. Today's moderator is Dr. Elias Zerhouni. Among his many accomplishments, he is a professor emeritus at Johns Hopkins, and he was the NIH director from 2002 to 2008. And I am very pleased to say that he is also a board member of Research America. Our panelists today are Isabel Lausuda, Lausada, excuse me, president and CEO of the Amyloidosis Research Consortium. I did practice that and wrote it out phonetically. Um, um, Isabel founded the consortium in 2015 to accelerate the pace of development for new and innovative treatments and to improve the quality of life for amyloidosis patients. Dr. Phil Sharp is the Institute Professor and professor of biology at MIT and a member of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research at MIT. He won the 1993 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for RNA splicing. Dr. Akshay Vaishna is president, research and development at Alnylam Pharmaceuticals and has been a longtime collaborator of Dr. Sharps. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Brian Zambra Witch is the Senior Vice President of Functional Genomics and Chief of Velocigene Operations at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Thank you all for being with us today, our terrific panel and our audience. And Elias, let me turn it over to you now. You now. Well, thank you. Uh, today, we're going to uh, really relive a journey, a journey from fundamental discovery to to patients. And in this particular case, to orient everyone, the discovery we're talking about is RNA interference. For years, the dogma has always been that DNA was transcribed into RNA and then translated into proteins by uh, ribosomes. But uh, many researchers had discovered in plants and other organisms uh, feedback loops uh, that really were interesting in the sense that you could uh, uh, modulate, in fact, the uh, translation and the expression of uh, protein, <clears throat> especially disease-causing protein, viral proteins that were invading a particular organism. And really, um, uh, Phil Sharp and I, when I was an IH director, we, we discussed many times the importance, centrality of the RNA world in, in biology. And his discovery of uh, RNA splicing, the discovery of reverse transcriptase, and then the discoveries of uh, of uh, RNA interference really were the basis for this journey. So without any uh, uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to Phil, who's lived this RNA world story. Phil, could you take it? Thank you, uh, Elias. Yes, uh, it's been a remarkable journey. Um, it, for my own personal part of that journey, I, it began at MIT in uh, 1977, where I had the uh, uh, great luck of discovering that uh, the genes in, in humans uh, and many other multicellular organisms come in pieces and 
that those pieces of information are assembled by a process called RNA splicing. And that placed RNA and the whole generation of RNA that then makes protein as a big field of RNA biology, particularly relevant to how complex cells in people carry out their biochemical function. But more to the specific day, uh, RNAi was uh, a discovery of uh, Farr and Mello. And uh, they were uh, studying how to inactivate a gene in a simple worm. This is a worm called C. elegans. It's in almost uh, soil samples around the world. Uh, it was chosen to be studied because it grows very rapidly. It has all the cell types that the human body has. It has many genes in common with the human body. And therefore, you could rapidly study the activity of genes. Do they make proteins? Do they allow the worm to crawl? Do they allow the worm to eat? Do they control aging of the worm? Do they control other processes in the worm? By um, rapidly using genetics. And that is called a model organism. Now, in this particular case, Farr and Mello was trying to identify a, a gene in the worm that caused the animal to move and uh, or was important for the animal to move. And they took RNA from that gene uh, and injected it back into the animal, uh, the antisense RNA, an RNA against or that would block the activity of a gene. And uh, what they found was that that inactivated the gene, but the control that should not have inactivated the gene, which was the other strand of the RNA, very technical here, but it's not important, didn't. And exploring why that control didn't work, they discovered that double-strand RNA, the two strands of RNA, uh, when injected into the worm, would silence the gene in the worm. And this was a remarkable discovery. Um, and it suggested that many organisms might have be able to read double-strand RNA, a atypical RNA structure that's seldom found in an organism to an activated gene. But when you look back in the literature, uh, there were studies in the early 90s from Jorgensen out in Arizona that introduced a gene that controlled the color of petunia in plants. And that gene inactivated the endogenous genes in the plant. Again, suggesting that there was some activity in those cells that was inactivating a gene. It turned out that was also RNAi. Uh, it was uh, a very elaborate process in plants. So here you see the fundamental discovery in plants in 1990, trying to just manipulate genes. And then in worms in 1998, trying to inactivate a gene, led to the conclusion that double-strand RNA was the component that, or activity within a cell that would direct the silencing of a gene. So when I had a chance to read uh, the Farr and Mello paper, uh, Andy Farr was a grad student in my lab at MIT long before he did this work, but we remained close friends. Uh, I was just thunderstruck because if this process could happen in mammalian cells, it would suggest that we could make double-strand RNA from every gene and then introduce it into a cell and then activate the expression of that gene. It basically turned the gene off. And uh, this was too promising to, to really ignore. And with colleagues at MIT, uh, Dave Bartell, another professor, uh, postdoc, uh, Tom Tushel, another postdoc, Phil Zamor, we started studying this process to see if we could identify the specific structure of RNA that was being used within the cell to inactivate the gene. 
And that took a, a year, year and a half, but we found Tom Tushel specifically that a, a very small piece of RNA, 21 nucleotides long, that is double strand, got both strands of the messenger RNA, when introduced into cells would silence a specific gene. And uh, this led us to think about, well, if this process can work in the laboratory, could it possibly work in the treatment of human diseases? Because we understood that most uh, diseases are caused by the activity of specific genes. And then the question was, well, could you treat those examples by introducing these double-strand RNA? And that led us with a number of people uh, who were venture capital and, and others to organize uh, an asylum in 2002. Uh, that was only four years after the discovery by Andy Farr in 1998, and then a little biochemistry at MIT and some uh, synthetic chemistry making RNAi. But we thought that this would be a long venture, but it could be a transformational venture in the treatment of human disease. Thank you, Phil. So this was the the background, if you will, of a connection between a fundamental discovery and immediately seeing the potential impact in human biology. But then it took a long time to sort of be applied. And, and, and that, that part of the journey in the company on Island was also led by Akshay uh, as head of research. Akshay, why did it take you so long? I mean, what was so difficult? I mean, after all, Phil's description is pretty straightforward. Why did it take you so long? What happened? Yeah, uh, Phil very eloquently described the process of RNA interference. And when I joined al Nile at the end of 2005, um, it was very clear that the molecular biology was very well understood in that, um, as Phil said, the blueprints, um, the genes that reside in our nuclei give off the, an intermediary molecule, a messenger RNA, which then is translated in the cytoplasm to proteins. And what Phil and others showed is that the, the intermediary messenger RNA, if you make a mirror copy, the, the so-called small interference RNA, that would, via the process of RNA interference, reliably cause degradation. And it had been shown over and over again in in vitro systems by 2005 that this was possible. What made the journey from then on challenging in terms of translating it in an intact organism, either small animals or into a human, uh, I would say there were three essential obstacles. One was that um, the, the molecule that mediates uh, RNA, a small interference RNA, as Phil said, a 21 base pair duplex, um, is very unstable and prone to degradation as soon as it's introduced into the body by enzymes turned nucleases. So that was one challenge. The second challenge is that these uh, small interference RNAs, uh, our drugs essentially, uh, were pro-inflammatory uh, because, the, as Phil said, the body doesn't normally see double-stranded RNA. The only context in which the body does see double-stranded RNA is typically during certain infections, often viral infections. And so the body has sensors to pick up double-stranded RNA and raise alarm bells and, and inflammation ensues. And so we had to make sure that we somehow disguised our drugs, the siRNA, so they didn't cause inflammation. And those first two challenges were met with a series of efforts in, in the laboratory by chemistry colleagues at Al Nilam and elsewhere by introducing chemical modifications onto these 21 base pair long siRNAs. And what that led to is that we could see by, if Al Nilam was founded in 2002, and by 2006 and 2007, we could see that we could reliably prevent the degradation of molecules in the body with chemical modifications that prevented the nucleases from acting. And those same types of modifications would also prevent recognition of sRNAs by receptors that caused inflammation in the body. So those first two challenges were met within three, four, five years, and Phil would remember the, the, those um, achievements well. And then in 2006, there was an offsite at Al Nilam, and Phil came, I was there, I'd just been there a short period of time, 
And I remember Phil standing at the front of the room saying, delivery, delivery, delivery. And, and this was the, the third, and in some senses, the biggest challenge. Uh, and that took us the best part of uh, almost a decade from when Al Nila was started in 2002. And the point is that even if you can stabilize the sRNA drug and prevent it causing inflammation, how do you get something so large, 14 kilodaltons, something that's um, you know several hundred times the size uh, of a typical small molecule, or 10 to 100 times the size of a typical small molecule, the kinds of medicines we all take by mouth, the blood pressure pill and antibiotic, these large molecules, the sRNAs, are not ingestible by the digestive tract. If you inject them into the bloodstream, they don't go through the cell membrane, the outer layer of a cell particularly easily. Um, and moreover, if they're not broken down, they'll just get flushed out in the urine. So how do you actually deliver the siRNA to a relevant cell type in the body for it to conduct the RNAi process against the messenger RNA that you're targeting and the gene you want to silence? And really, uh, some heroic work, and, and I use the word advisedly by my colleagues in the research and development group at Al Nilam, principally there, but also by certain other parties, led to two solutions over a decade. And one is encapsulating the siRNA in a lipid nanoparticle uh, permitted delivery to the liver. Um, and the liver is a principal source of interest to us, and we can discuss that later. And the other mechanism is to take the siRNA and not encapsulate it in a liposome or a lipid nanoparticle, but to attach to it a, a, a molecule that's then recognized by a receptor on the liver cell. And the receptor will grab the, the molecule that's been attached to the siRNA because there's a specific interaction there between the two and internalize the siRNA uh, into the liver cell, the hepatocyte, and then the siRNA can do its job. And it took us really from 2002 till 2013 to create those solutions of the lipid nanoparticle and the second approach, which we call GALNAC conjugates, the, the receptor ligand interaction. Um, and then demonstrate that they work effectively in humans. And the first demonstration of the proof of concept that you can create an sRNA against a gene target in an intact human and show silencing of that gene happened to be for a target uh, called transthyretin and a mutation in the transthyretin leads to transthyretin mediated amyloidosis, uh, a rare disorder which Lizada, uh, um, Isabel can tell us a lot about. Um, and so our first demonstrations in 2012 and 2013 uh, were against the transthyretin target because we wanted to help patients with transthyretin amyloidosis. And we were able to show successfully that we could dramatically reduce the production of transthyretin in patients with this disease, transthyretin amyloidosis. And, and therein, from 2013 onwards, we started feeling a lot more confident that after 10 years of work, we could effectively stabilize these molecules, sRNA, could prevent them causing inflammation, but most importantly, deliver them to a cell type where we wanted to silence the gene um, that could lead to therapeutic benefit for patients. So that, that, that 10 year journey was all about those three things really. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, Elias, uh, many iterative attempts uh, to perfect the lipid nanoparticle and the GALMAC technology. Um, and just to close the comments here, it, it's very exciting to us at Al Nilam that you know, much of the lipid nanoparticle technology that was invented for siRNA delivery has now been adopted by the messenger RNA field for companies at Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, and is assisting in the COVID effort indirectly. Now, we never knew when we were creating those lipid nanoparticles that ultimately someday it would help with that. But it's wonderful that that science has been leveraged for other uses like uh, using vaccines. So uh, the story goes on. You know, it's very fascinating because I did work with you actually when I was at Sanofi and we had a partnership and an alliance just on these uh, therapies. Once you had overcome what uh, were the essential obstacles. However, uh, when we, uh, we discussed it, uh, it was very clear that you had to select um, the particular targets that you would and diseases you wanted to go about. You were worried about off-target effects. If I recall, we were discussing that. Tell us a little bit about your, um, your strategy for choosing and avoiding off-target effects. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I, you know, the, our best friend uh, when it comes to uh, preventing off-target effects, and I'm sure Phil can speak much more uh, extensively than I could, but uh, it, it's to use the science of bioinformatics. So, so we understand the sequence, the, the gene sequence of our targets very well, the complete gene sequences of all the targets in the human body are known. Um, it's essentially with the recipients of the Human Genome Project and all the data that was generated there. Um, so we know that uh, this 21 base pair long siRNA that we want to create against any given gene target, um, may that sequence may be present in other genes and, and the messenger RNAs that we don't want to silence. And so we use bioinformatics um, using computers to, to, to search for that sequence so if our siRNA is targeting this particular 21 base pair sequence, we can interrogate the entire human genome and say, oh, does this exist anywhere else? And, and um, given that you need essentially uh, complementarity or matching along 21 base pairs, which is a lot, most of the time we find that there is no other 21 base pair sequence in the human genome that will cross react. And so uh, bioinformatics helps you uh, define a safe sequence. Now, on the odd occasion, there are partial overlaps. And more recently, we've shown that even partial overlaps can cause some recognition of, of off-target genes. But, but then we just simply go to another siRNA against the same gene and see whether that has any overlap uh, with any other gene. So iteratively in that fashion, even if there is overlap, you can select one that has no uh, uh, recognition by, onto other genes. Finally, I would say on very rare occasions, if the bioinformatics doesn't help you identify a unique sequence that doesn't cross react with anything else, you can say, okay, this is my target, this is my siRNA, and it matches perfectly as it should for the RNAi to work. Here's another thing that it matches, and maybe there are four or five nucleotides it matches. You can in vitro and in vivo compare the potency against the on target, the thing you want to silence, versus the off target. And there's a lot of detailed molecular biology behind this, but we know that depending on where the mismatches are between the on-target and the off-target, generally speaking, the off-target activity will be negligible to zero because of those mismatches. But you can demonstrate that in vitro and in vivo before you take that molecule further uh, for, for, for evaluation. So here we are, um, you've selected a target, you've found very specific coding regions that uh, are going to be able to reduce the expression of a harmful protein, in this case, uh, amyloidosis being overproduced. And, and so you're there, you've shown that in fact, there is a fundamental decrease. Now I wanna turn over to Isabel. And Isabel, um, you obviously are a kind of uh, patient organization that has taken a very uh, scientific approach an advocacy approach to the disease that your, your, uh, your patients suffer from. At what point did you uh, become uh, connected to uh, alnylam? Uh, you know, when we go into this journey from uh, a warm discovery to understanding that this is a great hope for your patients and which eventually became a, an approved uh, a therapy uh, for your patients, a therapy that is the first one, I believe, for, for the diseases that you are, uh, amyloidosis, disease, amyloidotic diseases. Isabel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we became actually, the Amyloidosis Research Consortium was founded in 2015. And really I had for many years been involved in different patient advocacy organizations across a number of rare diseases. And it really became clear that as you come into the rare disease space, there are significant challenges with how you develop products in a rare disease, particularly for companies that are going to be the first in. And with few products being developed and a huge risk, financial risk, there's a risk with the, number, the resources across the board, small numbers of patients. It's really important to get that right from the get-go. So we really looked at putting together a model with the consortium of how we might work very closely with companies, with regulators, with the experts in the field to really refine that process and also sure that the endpoints that were being measured were ones that were meaningful to patients. 
So we got very closely as we set, set up the consortium, the first thing we did was sit down with the uh, Al Nylum team and others to really figure out what would be the best model that would support development of products like these. Yes, and in terms of your patients, I mean, obviously the, both the neurologic and cardiology, cardiologic manifestations of these diseases are dire. And how did you manage the interaction, if you will, from the, the patients were suffering at the time expecting a therapy and the expectations of saying, wait a minute, we need to prove safety and efficacy and, and go through that FDA rigorous process. There's always this sort of uh, balance between you know, we want compassionate use, we want it now, you know, and yet at the same time, we're seeing now for the same thing with vaccines, for example. How did you manage that, that tension? And I think it's just incredibly challenging. I think it's important to recognize, particularly in the rare disease space, which amyloidosis is, that with between six and 8,000 rare diseases affecting 30 million Americans, and of those eight and 10 are probably caused by a faulty gene. And 95% of these have no approved treatments. And so it's really not a small disease issue. It's a really global issue to think about. And while I can't speak for patients as a whole, I can certainly talk about the impact on amyloidosis patients and you know, particularly those afflicted with hereditary transthyroidism. And thinking about um, a disease like this, that until two years ago had absolutely no treatments, was considered ultimately fatal and progressive, or progressive and ultimately fatal. Um, and in an autosomal dominant disease, how that impacts so many members of a family and the burden that it brings onto a family. I think one of the real um, challenges that we had expected was to see patients willing to participate in such an unknown type of study with such an unknown technology. What we actually saw was a huge commitment and understanding from the patient community that while it might not help them, that they were carving a pathway that might help the future generations of patients. And I think that's something that we really, the managing patients' expectations is really important to do. And ultimately we have had with this remarkable results. We now have diseases, a disease that is treatable. We have not only seen patients where their disease, the progression has slowed or halted, but patients are doing better than they were. And I think it really has brought us a step closer to envisioning a future where these diseases minimally impact the quality and length of life of patients. And I think that will change expectations for timelines and delivery of treatments. It's very different when you're the first participants in novel research. Yes, you know, let me um, follow up on a question uh, to Brian. Uh, it's really interesting to me that if you look at the history of, of therapeutics for dozens and almost a hundred year, it was limited to small molecules. And then all of a sudden today, we have an enormous armamentarium going from gene therapy, which is becoming successful after 30 years of uh, research and uh, monoclonal antibodies, which initially were considered tools, but not therapies and have become therapies. Um, you're looking at cell therapies where we're really uh, uh, trying to use the power of cells to control cancer. and other um, um, very creative uh, platforms, one of them being RNAi, another one being the use of mRNA, not to depress uh, expression, but to increase expression. So as we look at all of this armamentarium, it's really interesting to me that Brian and Regeneron, and, and I had worked with Regeneron both at the NIH and afterwards, and Alilam, and I work with you actually, you've come together, uh, why? Uh, antibodies and RNAi are so different. One is intracellular, one is extracellular. What, what's the story here, Brian? Sure. Well, um, I think that uh, uh, you have to realize that uh, the pipeline uh, at Regeneron and our drugs are almost ex exclusively monoclonal antibodies. And that limits the kind of target you can go after. It has to be seen outside the cell. It can be a secreted protein. It can be a receptor. Um, another case that people don't often think of, but cancer cells often express aberrant proteins or peptides, and if they're processed and presented in, in, at the cell surface in, in the MHC, 
you can make antibodies to those as well, uh, pig or peptide and groove antibodies. But we were really driven as a company to be able to go after um, all kinds of targets. And that was driven mainly by our human genet genetics effort. Uh, earlier in the year, we announced that we'd sequenced um, a million exomes from individuals with corresponding um, medical records. And that has really allowed us to make a number of discoveries, including uh, novel targets. And a great example of that is the HSD17B13 gene. We were able to identify loss of function um, uh, mutations in that gene that resulted in protection from uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis hepatitis or NASH. Um, but knowing that we couldn't go after it until we uh, teamed up uh, with Elm Island. And we were able to go extremely rapidly from the start of the program to filing a clinical trial application. And um, uh, we were also super intrigued about the work that um, Akshay and his team were doing in targeting the central nervous system as well as the eye. Uh, all those things really drew us to want to work with them. Yes. So the, the lesson I think uh, that I would wanted to illustrate is to what extent today uh, um, re research and development is driven by modalities. In other words, you have a tool and you use it. You have a hammer, everything looks like a nail or by targets, understanding targets, understanding new pathways, understand, and then figuring out whatever tool you need, uh, which is what you're saying, Brian, uh, to address it. And which trend do you think, and maybe I'll go back to Phil on this one, because Phil, as you can see, there is a tremendous uh, inflection point in the ability for us to use different tools, but our ability to, to understand biology and, and have really mechanistic clues to, to the, the targets that we need to modulate is not, is not as advanced maybe or is advancing and we need to truly find better ways. Even what I, uh, one of the concepts that I, I like is the concept of multi-targeting because diseases are complex and they rely on molecular networks that are not affected one at a time. Um, multiple ones are affected. So, Give us a sense, all of you uh, in the minutes that are left of the future. The balance between toolbox, targeting, genetics, discovery of biology. What's your view? Well, uh, the balance is amazing. And as you just mentioned, uh, it continues to expand. I mean, the balance in the future will also have cellular therapies, which are now very common, CRISPR therapies which is modifying cells in vivo and genetic engineering in vivo. So the, the, the challenge, the tools are, are becoming much more uh, available, but knowing the nature of the disease process, where the critical genes are controlling the rate of progression of the disease or the type of disease, is really our limitation in many approaches to treating these diseases. And now we have the human genome sequence and we're beginning to in integrate human genetics where variation between individuals point out these processes. And we, we heard Brian describe that in this NASH, uh, a liver-based uh, uh, disease. Uh, we are pushing forward. But it, our particular frontier, which is the most difficult to deal with, is looking at late chronic diseases, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS and just a whole host of late chronic diseases, including cancer, which is a late chronic disease. And uh, you know, taking approaches to that earlier in the disease process so you can stop the disease process and see the patient benefit enormously and without the additional cost of treating a someone for 20 years. So uh, that's the frontier. It's an integration of unknown science that's coming rapidly with all these tools. Akshay, what's your view of the future? Yeah, I, I think, you know, ultimately um, we're going to have to keep the patient perspective first and foremost, and, and it's about the nature of the illness, is it acute, is it chronic, the speed of onset that we need, 
uh, the type of drug profile that we need um, and finding the best tool uh, for, that, for that disease. Now, RNAi can be used for any gene in the genome. We can silence any of the 20,000 genes, but that doesn't mean that RNAi is the best for every disease. So for example, at one extreme, we can talk about, um, you know, if we have an uh, acute bacterial infection, um, a small molecule antibiotic will almost certainly be the best way to treat that disease because uh, it will get on board quickly in the body and start doing the job to kill the bacteria and help the patient. And so that's the right thing there. Uh, we can think of rather convoluted ways to apply RNAi, but it, it, it's probably not worth it. Uh, but on the other hand, as Phil said, if we think about, let me take another neurodegenerative disorder that we're collaborating with our friends at Regeneron on, Huntington's disease. You know, here is a, a long chronic disease with, with just dreadful consequences for patients and their families. We know the target, we know the Huntington's genes mutated, we know the protein does a lot of damage in the nervous system. Uh, if we could silence that gene uh, for Huntington's patients, then, then we could probably do it to patients a lot of good. And as Phil said, the earlier the better before damage is done to the brain. Um, and we're endeavoring with Regeneron to create such a therapeutic. And their RNAi has unique advantages because I think it's hard for small molecules to do that. Uh, people have tried and, and it's been a technical sort of real challenge. Antibodies can't access Huntington's. It's inside the, the proteins inside the neuron. Um, and so something that gets to the source of the uh, problem and silences the mutant gene would be the best way to go. And so RNAi is very applicable to these uh, uh, dreadful chronic disease. Of course, HAT amyloidosis that Isabel spoke about is another one where we've been able to silence the gene and reduce the production of the mutant protein by 80, 90% uh, for, for years now in patients with very good benefit, as Isabel was describing. So I think we, we have to keep the patient perspective and, and the risk benefit and what we need to do for the patient in mind and apply the, the best technology of which we have many great technologies now. I think we still have a challenge, and as Phil said, delivery, delivery, delivery. I mean, it's really <laughs> the signs that we need to improve. Um, uh, Isabel, uh, from your point of view, what would be a, a, a future for, for us to think about to better serve the patients? I, I think it's something that um, I think Akshay just touched on it too, is the importance of the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. So, and I think the other thing that has been really interesting to see in the amyloidosis community as treatments have, have evolved, how the risk benefit profile also evolves. And when there's no treatment, any treatment is better than nothing. So I think also, as we think about a future, there will be continuing a need, continuing need to see the evolution of these treatments to improve how they're administered, what side effects might happen, at what point in a disease that they can be administered. What we want to get to a point is that, you know, a minimal amount of intervention can, can happen before patients become symptomatic and really live for the rest of their lives with the burden of the disease. So I think there's a, a long way to go and this is really an amazing first step understanding, in fact, uh, the disease through biomarkers to uh, predict, to diagnose, to monitor is, I think, essential to the progress. Uh, Brian, let me come back to you. Phil said something uh, about understanding the mechanisms of disease, in particular complex diseases. I mean, monogenic diseases, I think we understand it. The, the practicality of addressing it is difficult, but the fundamentals are pretty understood. In complex diseases, it's otherwise. So, I'd like to reverse the question to you all. And what can RNAi as a tool tell us or any of the tools that we have? How can we accelerate and advance our understanding of disease processes, the clues that you just discovered, for example, for NASH? Is there a strategy there that would be more on the biology side of the disease rather than the therapeutic side of the disease? Any, any thought there, Brian? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think there's um, people have used siRNA to, to do screens, um, cell-based screens, and and try to uh, understand some of the disease biology better. Um, you know, I think that uh, my view is 
is um, much like Phil mentioned. I think um, the, the rate limiting thing in my mind remains understanding the fundamentals of what's going on in the, in the disease. And, uh, you know, but that's not magical either. I mentioned we as human genetics, we're very genetics focused, but you can look at things like Alzheimer's disease where we've known about the genetics for many, many years and we're still not there with a the therapeutic. So, um, but I think with sRNAs, just the ability to move fast from a discovery um, and a hypothesis, disease hypothesis, to being able to test it um, in animal models, ultimately then in man, it's, I think, unparalleled in speed. Yeah. Let me turn it over to the audience. I mean, we have a pretty engaged audience. I see a lot of questions coming up. Uh, if I may, um, I'll call on the Q&A and and um, I'll call on uh, on you, um, uh, Terry. Can you, uh, yes, help us? Yeah, sure. Well, I think the question on everyone's mind, and this question has come in in a few places, is, you know, open to all of you, we're in the middle of the worst pandemic. Uh, what can RNAi technology do to help us with the COVID crisis? What kinds of treatments and things are being explored? Mm -hmm. um, Phil, do you want to start? I, Regeneron are doing wonderful. Uh, I, I think Akshay, you, you, you've got the floor here. <laughs> well, I, I'll comment on RNAi, but I think we should also hear from Brian on, on this yeah. fantastic antibody work they're doing for COVID. So, you know, for our part at Al Nylum, this process of targeting uh, a gene and silencing it and, and stopping, stopping the relevant protein production can be applied to viruses as well as, as, as mutant genes in our bodies or genes we want to silence in our bodies. Um, and so the COVID genome is susceptible to RNAi once it infects the respiratory epithelial cell in the nose or the lung. Um, and so we've created um, a, a full panel of sRNA molecules that target the COVID genome and in fact uh, have proceeded and are very busy right now working with two of them for lung delivery uh, to help with the most severe complication of, of COVID-19, which is obviously the, the pneumonitis and everything that follows from that. Um, and so currently we've shown that the molecule is um, potent in vitro against uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And, and we've also got preliminary in vivo data in a hamster model. Uh, and we're repeating that and extending those to, to confirm what we've seen and, and, and get, get further findings. Um, and in parallel, we're doing the manufacturing work and the toxicology work to ready uh, the RNAi approach for, for taking into humans next year, hopefully. So, a lot of work has gone on in a very short period of time, as is at other companies. Uh, we know that uh, it can be a potent and specific approach uh, to the COVID problem, and we hope to get there very soon into the clinic uh, next year. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Happy to have further questions. Um, Brian, maybe you want to comment on, on your efforts. Sure. So we've been working in infectious disease for a while. And um, we have an antibody cocktail for the Ebola virus consisting of three antibodies, which proved to be very effective um, in treating Ebola patients. Uh, they went from approximately a 70% death rate if they were treated early enough to a single digit um, death rate uh, percentage. Um, and that same uh, concept of an, an antibody cocktail we've used for the Ebola virus. Now with the Ebola virus, the it's spike COVID. protein that al allows infection of cells is smaller, so we can only get two antibodies in the cocktail. Um, but uh, we hope very soon to have um, uh, to present our results and um, hopefully get an EUA. Um, but the, the importance of the cocktail part rather than a single antibody is really clear, and that's that, uh, and we've published this, uh, with a single antibody, uh, it's pretty rapidly, it, the, the virus pretty rapidly mutates around uh, the ability of that antibody to block it. But with the uh, cocktail, that is a really very rare event. Yes. Thank you. 
Um, uh, just a, 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 actually, I don't know if you mentioned it, but the RNAi therapy delivery that you're thinking about is direct inhalation, right? Uh, I don't right, know. Right, right. I should I should have said that, Elias. That yes, it, it it's inhalation via nebulizer device, the type that uh, type of device that asthma patients would use to 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 take their medications. Um, and uh, you know, currently it's in the animal setting, and so we have devices to to expose animals to it and do the toxicology and animal model work. <clears throat> We'll yeah. take that same approach into humans, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Terry? Yeah, sure, we've got other questions. Um, it was suggested, I think, by Brian that RNAi might be useful, uh, more useful than other approaches for targets in the central nervous system and in the eye. Are there particular advantages, problems, challenges, successes of uh, RNAi therapies in that area? Uh, Brian, you wanna kick off or shall I? Then? Why don't you kick off? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the challenge for therapeutics for, for the nervous system and the eye, and certainly certainly the nervous system, is that to device small molecule uh, tablet-based therapeutics for the nervous system has been incredibly challenging. And, and we know that we have a limited set of useful drugs uh, that we can take by mouth as pills for a variety of neuropsychiatric disorders. They're important medicines. They do a lot of good, but we need a lot more given the range of diseases, particularly intractable neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, and chronic pain and others. And, and um, for those uh, types of diseases, small molecules have been very hard to generate and, and antibodies can't really get, get into the nervous system and can't get into the neurons and other cell types where you need to attack the target. So uh, a sequence-based approach like RNAi um, offers many significant advantages because you can go for any of the relevant genes that are mediating these, these terrible neurodegenerative disorders. About two or three years ago, our team here at al Nalem came up with an approach for the delivery of sRNAs to the nervous system. Um, and this was a great breakthrough for us and we hope the feel, and just as we could make progress in the liver once we got the liver delivery sorted out back in 2012-13, this recent progress with delivery to the nervous system. Hopefully we can, you know, get, we, we file our first IND next year for Alzheimer's. Um, and then after that, we want to follow with Huntington's and others. Um, and um, that's, that's, that's the work that's inspired us greatly lately. And, and was, we'd already been working with Regeneron on HSD 17 p 13 the NASH target in the liver. But Brian, maybe you can talk about what you saw as the pros cons of an RNA approach. Yeah, well, again, going back to monoclonal antibodies, uh, you're lucky if you can get 1% of um, the circulating levels uh, systemically to get in the brain. So it's really not very realistic to use an antibody. And I've, I've worked on small molecules for the CNS as well, um, which uh, is extremely difficult to get um, all the properties you want and get it uh, past the blood-brain barrier. Um, but I think that uh, one of the more important things is the, the very diseases that Akshay was talking about, neurodegenerative diseases like ALS, et cetera, uh, I think a lot of the targets aren't amenable to any of those things. The, but the, the ability to universally go after any target based on sequence um, it can be done with SIRNA. So, uh, Lee, uh, Elias? Yep. Yes, I, I just want to add, you know, typically when you think you go into human patients, you're trying to avoid problems. And, you know, if you can walk that line and not get problems, uh, then you're, you're a winner. But occasionally there are new findings. And the new finding is these RNAs in the central nervous system, but more where the data is strongest in the liver, are really remarkably long-term inactivity. Literally for some of these diseases, one administration over six months is going to work. And uh, it, we didn't anticipate that from our animal, animal studies, but now that we have uh, studies in humans and a variety of diseases, it's just uh, remarkably uh, how long-term some of these uh, silencing activities are. So I, I think it's a very big uh, difference, uh, advantage, and uh, a long-term game changer. Yes, very good point. Um, 
especially um, in the nervous system. Um, in terms of the eye, uh, Brian, could you uh, uh, specify why the eye is important to you? Because Regeneron is actually a leading company in uh, eye therapies. Yeah, we're of course um, obsessed with the eye. Our largest selling drug is Ilea. It's given for wet age uh, related macular degeneration and also diabetic retinopathy. Um, uh, and so we consider the eye really important. And there's a lot more things we'd like to do there. Uh, when you think of the one of the biggest unmet medical need over all anywhere, dry AMD is still um, not uh, been touched by any therapeutic. And so we continue to be really excited about the eye. Thank you, Terry. Any other questions? Yes, quite a few. Um, another question that I'm seeing is around uh, the silencing of genes. And let me read, uh, pull this one back up because I have so many here. Can this approach work um, in activating silenced genes? I think Phil is the expert here. Right? We would invite Phil to comment on that. So um, yes, in many cases, uh, because a cell has to be stable over long periods of time, almost all the systems in cells have forward activating processes and reverse feedback processes that inactivate. So in a situation of that type, uh, you can inactivate the forward activity and that reduces the gene, or you can inactivate the feedback mechanism and that increases the level of the gene. So it, it, typically the increase is an indirect approach. The, the decrease is a direct approach, but in many cases you can get uh, relief from a disease process by manipulating the feedback system. Um, that's a little more complicated. It requires understanding in the disease process. Excellent. Very anything else? Uh, and yeah, actually, yeah, just to just build a little bit on that, um, if there is a stability problem with your RNAi molecules, how do you get around that with nebulizers? Yeah, so um, harkening back to something we discussed earlier, um, if you introduce chemical modifications onto our drugs, the siRNAs, that can really prevent the degradation uh, by nucleases. And, and we've shown that that works throughout the body. So whether you then put the siRNA into the bloodstream to get to the liver or into the nervous system or into the lung, um, they're rendered resistant to degradation. And so they're, they're, they're around for a long time to do their job. And as Phil just said, they, we can, tune in these modifications to give six, 12 months of activity to our drugs after a single dose, if we wanted. And so that's those same mechanisms are helping with the COVID project and the stabilization of the drugs uh, that, that we're trying to develop for COVID. Um, and and they, they also make them resistance to degradation in these mechanical devices like nebulizers. We've tested that before actually. Great. I have a question, Terry, just before we run out of time. So Yeah, we've got time, I think, just for one more. Um, it's been pointed out in the comments that um, one of the key things that accelerated this amazing work in the medical application is the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980 that encouraged MIT to set up and do the licensing. Um, what are there other things that uh, policymakers can do or be aware of to uh, expend and speed this kind of medical progress so that more lives can be improved and saved. And um, Elias, that's a great one for you. Well, I think I, I let everyone because they live the experience. And uh, one, one point I would make is uh, policymakers should help FDA develop regulatory science of these novel areas. And accumulating regulatory knowledge is really difficult if you don't have the scientists to do it uh, well at the FDA. So funding the FDA to have a regulatory science capability uh, uh, early on when these things come up, because I've seen a lot of delays in understanding, you know, biosimilars, for example, took forever for FDA to, to come up with guidance. So that would be one point, I, but I'll let the panelists uh, chime in. So let me make a point here. I think it's a very important point. We've heard uh, through this whole presentation that RNAi was discovered in 1998. Uh, Beers 
I mean, uh, Anilum started in 2002, and the first approved product was in 2018, 16 years after the establishment. I can tell you that that 16 years took almost a billion dollars worth of investment from a variety of different sources. So uh, that's expensive, I know, but it wouldn't have been done without that investment. It could not have been done. And it had to be done, in my opinion, by a small company who would persist even when they fail and turn around and keep at it. And that's the journey of new technology. It requires resources, but it also requires prudent use of those resources. So um, without the ability to protect this technology and, and gain the resources to continue to develop it, uh, this journey will not happen. Maybe one comment for me is that I think we have to keep funding basic science in a big way because, you know, monoclonal antibodies, it was 1975, they were, uh, that technology was discovered in an academic lab. Likewise, um, we heard about RNAi uh, discovered in an academic lab. More recently, we have CRISPR Cas9 discovered in uh, an academic academic lab. I think we have to have that continued discovery so that we can continue to push the frontiers of what's treatable. By the way, uh, on the specific question of the Bayh-Dole Act, I can tell you when I was the uh, director of NIH, I would travel around the world and I had two very common questions. One was, we want a Bayh-Dole Act for our country, <laughs> whether it be Japan, France, everybody want to emulate that because it opened up a completely new world of possibilities and opportunities that the government could not uh, fund. And the second was the peer review process. In other words, rigorous peer review of the basic science that needs to be done. Um, but the concept that Brian just described is absolutely essential. We don't know enough. I mean, you just heard it in complex diseases, chronic diseases. I, I don't know, we don't know the cause of diabetes. We don't know the cause of Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot more research that needs to be done, but it has to be at the fundamental level, not, not the applied level. We know uh, what to do once we understand a mechanism, like it becomes an engineering issue. The other one is really a discovery. So the Bayh-Dole Act is essential, but continuous efforts is, is critical to that. Now I had a really quick question, maybe not so quick, but uh, so we talked about one part of the RNA world uh, RNA interference. We talk, we know about mRNA and the ability to express a protein of value like in vaccines. But there are lots of, re of regions of the DNA that code for RNA that are not translated into proteins, right? Long non-coding RNAs, microRNAs. Uh, what do you think is the role of RNA interference in that context? Instead of repressing a, the production of a protein, repressing a pathway, a, a, a signaling pathway maybe, I don't know. What do you think? Is there a role there? I, I think it's uh, an unanswered question, uh, Elias. Um, as you pointed out, when you were talking about proteins, we're talking about 2% of the genome. The rest of the genome we call non-coding. And we know there's RNAs produced from them. We know these RNAs are involved in novel processes that we just discovered a couple of years ago. So there's a lot to be discovered there. And uh, maybe that part of the genome is, is treatable as well. But um, uh, we are not sufficiently uh, advanced in our understanding to be able to say that now. Hence the point that Brian is making, that we need to continue to invest primarily in basic research. So with that, I think we're almost out of time. I want to thank the panelists. This was a, a fascinating uh, discussion. Again, I wanted to illustrate the long journey, but frankly, 20 years is not that long in, uh, in, the, in the world of medicine. So I just, I, I wanted to set it up that way because it is a long effort and it's very expensive, it takes hundreds and thousands of people. But I think it's remarkable that it led to patients' benefits in 20 years. I mean, gen therapy, you know, look, we started in the 70s. We're still not there, I mean, after 50 years. So it was quite a, a rapid journey relative to many other journeys. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Jenny. 
Thank you, Elias. And thank you to Isabel, Phil, Akshay, and Brian. What an amazing panel. Elias, you summed it up much more articulately than I could have, but I will say that um, it goes to the very heart of what Research America is all about. Um, so thank you again. Just really tremendous, insightful, inspiring, um, terrific. Uh, just two quick announcements. Um, on Monday, November 23rd, that's this coming Monday, we will be celebrating Public Health Thank You Day. And we encourage you to join us on social media and thanking our dedicated public health workforce you can get a toolkit and resources on our website and in the chat. We've done this now for 15 years. Obviously this year, the public health workforce has been under um, more strain than ever. Um, and we want to acknowledge them. And then I also wanted to let you know about a terrific opportunity to nominate for our 2021 Research America Advocacy Awards. In April, 2021, the 25th anniversary um, of our advocacy awards will take place and they will recognize the extraordinary work and enormous contributions made in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, and we're going to be offering or, or honoring um, a, a special set of individuals and entities through something called Ec the Excellence in Achievement in Public Health Awards. So these awards will honor individuals, entities, partnerships, who excelled in discovery, innovation, communication, and leadership uh, during the pandemic. We know there are many, many uh, people and entities deserving of these honors. So please get your nominations in before December 2nd. Uh, the info uh, is in the chat as it was for Public Health Thank You Day. Um, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you again to our terrific panelists. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.